Sometimes the stories behind everybody's favorite cartoons are even crazier than the cartoons themselves. From the origins of the Powerpuff Girls to why certain animation choices get made and more, we've got a lot to unpack today. So let's get into it. Whoop Ass Stew, A Sticky Situation is a one real film and the first ever appearance of what is now known as the Powerpuff Girls. So if you watch it, the opening title begins with an early version of Professor Utonium using the original recipe of sugar, spice, and everything nice to try and create the perfect girl, but then he accidentally adds a can of Whoop Ass and creates, yep. Yeah, the girls. In a similar way to the current series, the girls race towards an early gangrene gang and beat them up. So this was a project that Craig McCracken made while at CalArts College in 1992. He sent it off to Cartoon Network while working at Hanna-Barbera Studios, and they renamed it Powerpuff Girls because the original name was a little bit inappropriate for the channel's target audience. McCracken actually had four shorts planned out, but only this first one got finished due to Cartoon Network's lack of interest in the original concept. And yes, they were like, you had to make some other changes as well. And while the name was changed, not a lot else was. But let's go over a couple of them. Originally, Professor Utonium looked like an aged, bald version of Dexter from Dexter's Laboratory, with a different head shape and a head mirror. And in this short, the girls didn't seem to have any superpowers except the ability to fly and breathe in space. Despite the lack of superpowers, though, it can be said that the girls were definitely more brutal here, as instead of merely knocking around the gangrene boys, they deliberately killed the Amoeba Boys. In this short, these guys were capable of committing actual crimes and even knew how to use weapons. Boss Man had a cigar in his mouth, Slim had really sharp teeth, and Junior had freckles. They all had purple spots on their bodies instead of the light blue ones, and their voices were a lot more garbled. In the final series that we know and love, these guys are completely inept at crime. They're more of a nuisance than anything. Slim's body is a lighter color compared to Bossman and Junior, but at the end of the day, when it comes to the Powerpuff Girls as we know it, adult references and humor are packed into the background of many of these seemingly sweet and innocent episodes. But just kind of neat to know what could have been. For a while, fans of Adventure Time were certain the fantastical land of Ooh was actually set years in the future after a devastating apocalypse. And that theory seemed to have been confirmed in the season two episode, Video Makers, which references the devastating mushroom war. However, it actually took the show's creator much longer to recognize the dystopian setting Finn was romping around in. The accidental genius of Adventure Time is the apocalypse was added as the show developed, and the intentional genius was the decision to keep the apocalypse secondary. Pendleton Ward admitted that a lot of the show's canon is created by a writer for a single episode, and then it just sticks for the rest of the series. So it wasn't until Season 1's Episode 8 that Ward realized he had set Adventure Time in a post-apocalyptic world. Up to that point, he thought he created a fantasy land. However, when a scourge of businessmen rose up from a lake in the episode, Business Time, he realized, oh, the fans are right. So this show, in presenting relatively stable societies that grow after the Mushroom War, actually might be more realistic than its adult counterparts when it comes to presenting a post-apocalyptic society. Look, if I were to tell you, okay, post-apocalypse world, what do you got? It's a stereotype. Ruined cities, silent and buried, all these survivors mutated, monstrous, dark. But then you look at shows like Futurama, and they give us glimpses of that while poking wild fun. So then in Adventure Time, some mangled, broken debris does give us a bit of an indication that this was once our world, but very little survived the war, and what did was altered. But not always for the worse. Magic was set loose on the world, which is hard to consider disastrous. At the end of the day, Finn and Jake are not holy fools or inhabitants of a new Eden, both of which are tropes of other kinds. They're just two folks living as best they can. Survival is not the be-all end-all presented by most apocalyptic fiction. Heck, it can even be fun. So the Walt Disney Company has been known to reuse the odd idea or two. Being resurrected from the dead via acts of true love is just one of them. But have you ever been watching a Disney movie and had a bit of deja vu? Not just that, oh, this movie has that familiar Disney look and feel sort of thing, but more like, I swear I've literally seen this exact scene before in another movie? Well, it turns out it's not just plot lines Disney has recycled, but actual animation as well. And the evidence is there in plain sight, but you gotta ask, like, why? So, there's some rumors here. Let's go through them and then we'll go through the truth. One big rumor goes that in the 1970s, when Disney movies like Robin Hood came out, the studio was broke, and recycling old animation was a cheap way to make ends meet. So during the phony King of England, some of Maid Marian's dance moves are rotoscoped from those of Snow White. 
and also Duchess. Meet Marion's design was eventually reused for that of Vixie's from The Fox and the Hound, although Vixie is less anthropomorphic and more realistic looking. However, while that would have certainly saved some time from designing and planning new movement sequences, it isn't the whole truth. According to Floyd Norman, a Disney animator, the director of Robin Hood and Winnie the Pooh, Wolfgang Reitherman, wanted to play it safe by using animation he knew worked. Look, at the end of the day, after Walt passed away in 1966, the studio lost its guiding star, and Disney's profits from their animation features went down. So what Wolfgang was doing was perhaps an attempt to recapture some of the Walt Disney magic by sticking with the old charm. And then we got all those films from that period that featured direct copies of the studio's older animations just put a scoped. It's kind of like some of the nostalgia baiting unnecessary sequels we see today. But these movies were like, okay, original movie, just we're gonna take what we like. All right, here's the reality. Disney's been recycling its animation for various movie scenes since it created Dumbo in 1941. According to Floyd, Walt Disney himself probably never even knew or noticed that animators were recycling scenes. He was focused more on the big picture. And while he was concerned with details, this was something he was like, it works. At the end of the day, animators are magicians. Whatever tools they use to make the magic happen, so be it. You're doing amazing, folks. If you want to talk about movie Easter eggs, A113 is perhaps one of the greatest and most elusive ones there is. If you look closely enough, in almost every single Pixar feature, you'll find that silly little code concealed in the depths of CGI. But what exactly does it mean? So the answer takes us back all the way to Pixar's origins. The spirit of Pixar was cultivated by names such as John Lasseter, Pete Docter, Andrew Stanton, and Brad Bird. Those folks are all alumni of the prestigious California Institute of Arts. And what's more, they and many other future Pixar animators all learned their craft in the same classroom, A113. It was apparently a dingy and cramped room, mind you, but nevertheless, it was a place where Pixar would essentially be born. And it's thought that Brad Bird began the fun tradition of hiding A113 in Disney films, starting with The Brave Little Toaster. The tradition continued with the development of Pixar, appearing in the studio's first feature, Toy Story. Now, if you're more of an audio Easter egg person, the incredible John Ratzenberger has a voice role in almost every single Pixar movie ever made. Sometimes it's a main part that's easy to find, such as Ham and Toy Story. But other times, it's a little more tricky to suss it out. And he's not the only one. Alan Tudyk is another Disney voice Easter egg. He's done a lot of super fun voices over the years. We all love Hey Hey, right? And finally for today, by their very nature, cartoons aren't exactly intended to be realistic. Okay, how many grand pianos have you been crushed by lately? But besides all that fun stuff, there's something distinctly unrealistic about classic cartoons. Their fingers. Just take notice of your favorite cartoon characters. Chances are they only have four digits. And that's because around the early 20th century, when animation was still new, it was super expensive. In fact, adjusted for inflation, Disney's 1928 seven minute short Steamboat Willie cost over $87,000. Granted, Pixar movies nowadays cost as much as $100,000 per minute of animation, but those modern flicks are a lot more complex. And Disney has a ton more resources available now than it did way back when. Back then, Disney animators had to be kind of thrifty. They realized that drawing just one less finger saved a ton of time, which in turn saved heaps and heaps of money. The cost effectiveness is only just part of the reason why classic cartoons look like cartoons. Realism was just too much, and it was too expensive. Characters were aesthetically simplified. Even in more recent times, animators have created similar shortcuts, such as Ursula the Octopus having only six tentacles instead of eight. Intriguingly, given that cartoon fingers need to be large enough to see individually, animators have also concluded that five fingers just don't look right. Walt Disney even said himself that if Mickey Mouse had five fingers, his hands would look like bunches of bananas, and nobody wants that. Also, speaking of Mickey's hands, what's the deal with those gloves? What's he hiding? While it's possible that Mickey's fingers might look all kinds of weird under those gloves, there are indeed a few key official reasons why classic cartoon characters like Mickey wear those white gloves. Similar to the four finger situation, drawing gloves was quicker and easier, which cuts down money. Also, hands present a lot of time consuming challenges. You got those joints, you got the nails. Whereas gloves, easy peasy, you don't have to worry about the little details. It also had to do with color back in the day. Color TVs weren't mainstream until the 1960s. So characters like Mickey Mouse began in black and white. So for Mickey having a mostly black body, it made sense for him to have contrasting white hands. So then they didn't get lost. Fun fact, in Steamboat Willie, he didn't have gloves yet. In addition to that, Walt also revealed in his 1957 biography that the gloves were intended to make him look a little more human. Well, that's it for me once again, folks. I've been Alexa, your resident Yuki Spooky girly. See y'all next time, you lovely spooky people.